all a very warm good evening to all of you i hope you are doing very well now i want to welcome you all on my behalf and behalf on behalf of mood course society law center 1 now i invite our professor in charge professor sarabjit taneja to formally invite our esteemed guest advocate animesh sinha professor taneja a very good evening to advocate animesh sinha my learned colleagues and our enthusiastic students it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural session of the workshop series on mooting skills titled is the art of mooting importance of mooting organized by the moot court society of law center 1 I am reminded today of the words of celebrated Sufi poet Rumi: "Raise your word, not your voice. It is rain that blows flowers, not thunder." Words, when in dictionary, are innocent and powerless, but when combined in the right sequence with the right intention, they become powerful instruments of change and justice. Being a lawyer. requires one to harness that power of words and this is where mooting plays a very crucial role every good debater may not be a good mooter indeed oratory skills are an asset yet training the mind the speech and the heart for the courtroom is an all round endeavor to achieve this the moot court society of law center 1 tries to integrate the theoretical and practical aspects of law by conducting various moot court activities through its various activities and events the moot court society serves the objective of training the students in drafting researching mooting and gaining advocacy skills facilitating the students to participate in moot court competitions at national and international level and inculcating the values of cooperative working peers learning and fair competition our students have brought many laurels to the law center one by their exemplary participation in moot court competitions over the past many years we are certainly proud of them respecting the covid-19 restrictions and yet keeping the mooting spirit alive this year the moot court society has planned online events to impart practical training to the students under the able guidance of the convener dr alok sharma the faculty members of the society have planned an online series of workshops over the next few weeks to inculcate skills of moot these workshops would provide a great exposure to the students through interaction with the resource persons opportunity for self introspection and encourage development of various skills required of the computer today's workshop is an introduction to the art of mooting it intends to aid the students in finding answers to various questions like why should one moot who can moot does it help with court practice does it it help if one does not aspire to practice in courts how is it different from public speaking or debates what skills does one need to develop and many more i would like to extend a warm welcome to our resource person advocate animesh sinha i'm certain that the interaction with him would greatly benefit the students it's my pleasure to extend a hearty welcome to all my colleagues and our dear students who have joined the workshop apart from training program and a workshops and orientation program the moot court society has scheduled the internal moot court competition as a first hand exposure for the students all these activities of the moot court society would enable the students to acquaint themselves with the practical training as a lawyer and to participate in various external events i appreciate the convener of the moot court society dr alok sharma for taking this initiative with the support of faculty members dr sushmita malya 
डॉक्टर संजीवनी रैना डॉक्टर दया देवी मिसिज शिविका चौधरी एंड मिस्कर मिस्टर पुष्कर आनंद this kind of practical training would certainly provide the impetus to the students of law center 1 to be a skilled legal professional and a valued member of the legal fraternity as a teacher i wish that our students achieve the highest of the milestones in their career and may learn effectively from the distinguished speakers who can further the knowledge and practical skills of our students with real world experiences once again i welcome all of you thank you thank you madam for your wonderful words about the society and its initiative now before i ask our speaker to start the session i would like to mention few words about him his achievements mr animesh sinha is a managing direct partner at animesh sinha and partners as a who is the keynote speaker in our workshop a uh, title ace the art of mooting importance of mooting mr sinha is known for his expertise in litigation arbitration contracts and corporate law he regularly represents large business houses infrastructure companies insurance companies and high net individuals before supreme court of india high courts in various states of india tribunals and in arbitrations he has been retained by several business houses for legal advice and transactions on commercial law animesh specializes in negotiation and preparation of contracts and has prepared contracts for a range of sectors from it transportation commercial consultancy media sports projects like greenhouse energy infrastructure and construction starts up etc among others mr animesh is a member of supreme court bar association bar council of india indian society for international law and the insurance institute of india he has been a distinguished student and continues his engagements with academic activities teaching at the top law schools an executive training events and judging international moot court competitions he has taught special courses at oriental insurance company staff training institute national law university delhi dsnlu visakhapatnam and amity law school delhi on insurance civil litigation system dealing with contracts litigation drafting law of outer space and moots i hereby welcome you sir on behalf of law center 1 to guide our students with your learned words on today's agenda that is the workshop which we uh, have organized for our students to inculcate the uh, skills of mooting thank you thank you alok ma'am thank you sarabjit ma'am thank you sanjeevni ma'am thank you so much for that lovely introduction ma'am the part which is sweetest for me is the fact that sanjeevni ma'am has remembered me after so many years i have been her student and today the fact that i am able to participate in this event uh, gives me great pleasure and therefore my introduction as a student is what gives me the greatest amount of pleasure than all of the other things i'll give a brief uh, uh i maybe share my views as to what i hope this session would be about and late in this evening at 7 to 8:30 this is not a, a pre sleep session where i lull you to sleep i understand that by the time we reach 7 pm it's later in the day and everybody is exhausted and this is the evening session and therefore what i intend to do is let's keep this conversational this is more about a chat about moot courts than really a lecture or a training and along the way i'll share my experiences of how i dealt with moot courts as a student how it has helped me as a lawyer how i enjoy judging moots today how i enjoy workshops on moot courts drafting of moot court problems and essentially how moot courts has become such an integral part of my life even 12 13 years after i have graduated from law school moot court is something which can be so enjoyable that it stays with you 
there are many judges uh, of the Supreme Court and High Court with whom I had had the chance of interacting after uh, they had retired or while they were serving on the bench. And they also remember very fondly their days of moot court. And therefore, moot court is just not another extracurricular activity or academic activity. Moot court really becomes a part of our lives. And therefore, it's a very enjoyable session. Now, why should you bear with me in this evening session, at least twice a week from here on? I think why you should bear with me is not only because I love mooting so much, but also because I've had the chance of looking at moot courts from different perspectives. First, as a mooter myself, I participated in Philip C. Jessup's, Manfred, Commonwealth, Henry Dunant during my time at law school. And thereafter, I have graduated. I have had the chance of judging different moot court competitions around the country, whether they are public international moots like Jessup's, Manfred, Stetson, but also moot courts which are on international trade, arbitration, also different national laws and trial moots. And the idea of this session is to give you a whole perspective as to how you look at moot courts. I have found that while we sit and draft moot court problems, it teaches us a lot. And it's a lot of fun to build a problem which can be argued from both sides. And such is the case when we are speaking about moot courts. There are many facets and some of which requires to have a fine balance, which is what we aim to cover in this series. Now, who is this? For who are the people this series is for? Why? Who would want to be part of this series? This series is not only for people who have had no background in moot courts, but this is also for people who have done some amount of moot courts, even those who have had a lot of success, because the idea is that there is so many exchange of ideas that can happen with moot courts. There are so many different variables that even today we are learning, uh, listening to stories from uh, different moot courts, different moot court judges. Like I said, the format of the session is not supposed to be lecture oriented. And I understand we are doing this through a video conferencing platform. And therefore, there are certain limitations of interacting. But I will request participants to feel free, put in their questions in the chats. Uh, I'll be uh, very happy to be able to answer some of these questions at the end. And just to ensure that it is not chaotic, we can reserve a session towards the end while we can deal with some of these questions. Therefore, I will recommend if you have a pen and paper before you, some of these points may be worth noting, recording. And this would not only be of use to ask questions at the end of the session, but sometimes you write something down. And later, when you are doing a moot court and you're facing a live issue, sometimes referring to notes are of great help. Now. The first question that I put for today's session, who can moot? And quite honestly, anyone can moot. Anyone who can communicate can moot. And communication does not necessarily have to be in a very fluent manner or in a very grammatically correct manner. In fact, many people have this misconception about moot courts that you are good with moot courts if you are a fluent speaker if you find it easy to present your ideas. In fact, it's, it's quite the contrary. While we begin moots, I have seen many people who are accustomed with public speaking or debates in school, they find it very easy to graduate to doing moot courts. But actually, that's, that's a disadvantage. If you have a very strong background in debates and public speaking, there are a lot of aspects which you need to unlearn to be a good mooter, of course. The confidence of being able to speak on a public platform or being able to speak in front of different people always comes in handy. But that apart, it does not mean that only those who are good with public speaking or debates or extemporary speeches can be good mooters. So who can moot? Anyone who can put in the hard work or whatever is the required amount of work in a moot court can moot. If I'm able to read a moot court problem, if I'm able to analyze the proposition, if I'm able to prepare the question and answers and have some kind of clarity, if I'm able to write a memorial, 
if I'm able to present myself on the given day and not chicken out from the competition due to nervousness or whatever reason, I can moot. These are the criteria which are relevant. What is not important is that you're very good with the law, you studied the law, you know the law at the back of your hand, you are a fluent speaker, your grammar is excellent, you come from a background where public speaking has been in your experience. These are not critical requirements to moot. In my experience, especially when I started judging, I realized that there were a lot of participants who were not very fluent speakers and had trouble with fluency of presenting the idea vis-a-vis -vis the English language. But the clarity of thought with some of these speakers was excellent. And this leaves a more, a stronger impression than somebody who is speaking very fluently, but the conduct and the analysis uh, is weak. Therefore, who can moot? I think anybody who is willing to go through the experience of moot court can moot. And it's not just a case of participation. It is a case of successful participation. The next question is, does it really help with court practice? I certainly think so. It really helped me with my court practice. And how does it help with court practice? One, it helps with court craft. There, when you are a young lawyer and you're stepping into court, you have all kinds of butterflies in your stomach. The judges are three times your age. Uh, the other lawyers, they are very seasoned. You are not, you're still getting used to the look and feel of a courtroom. You're still getting used to the walk to the podium. You're still getting used to looking at the display board to see when your item will be called out. You're still getting used to which side you're supposed to stand on. You're still getting used to how to deal with all the case papers. And some of these things can be very overwhelming for a young lawyer. Moot courts is an excellent precursor to these very simple basic aspects. I realized that as a young lawyer, when I walked into a courtroom and I was handed a brief to make an argument before a judge, amongst the many things I had to worry about, what I did not have to worry about were these small things, which create butterflies in your stomach. How would you approach a courtroom? Where would you stand? What would you say? Whether you will address the court as your lordships, my lord, your honor, uh, whether you're going to say a good morning, whether you're going to say a sorry, whether you're going to say a hello, hi, uh, is it fine to say a you, your to the court? Some of these very fundamental aspects require some kind of pre-knowledge and some kind of training to get used to. And moot courts is an excellent way of learning these things. Does it help if I don't want to get into court practice? What in case I want to be a corporate lawyer? Or in case I want to be an in-house lawyer? Or what in case I want to get into academics? Or what in case I want to do amongst the many other options that I have when I graduate? Do moot courts help still? And I know of some friends of mine, as well as people I've seen over the years, who have a very strong view against moot courts. They say that uh, there are other activities which are more useful and you should dedicate more time to maybe writing a paper, publishing, going for debates, parliamentary debates. Some of those activities would be well worth your time than moot courts. Now, certainly. Writing a paper, going for debates, going for other public events, going for other competitions, writing essays, all of these have their own advantages. And none of them are substitutable to moot courts. Why? Because the amount of analysis that you require to do in a moot court, the amount of grilling and questioning that you have to go through when you do a moot court, gives you a very strong foundational training how to deal with the law, the subjects, different people who are involved with the law, dealing with clients, dealing with opposite side, dealing in a negotiation. A lot of these skills are of great use when you moot. So why drop a moot? If you are wanting to write a paper, if you are wanting to debate, uh, why not moot as well? There is no harm to not moot and pick some of these activities. My view is that every law student should at least have one or two experiences of a moot court, even if you decide that it's not your thing and that's not what you want to do. Therefore, who should moot? 
every law student should moot. Now, how is it different from public speaking or debates? Sarabjit, ma'am, put that, that is it that debates is a foundation to moot courts? And a lot of people think, yes, debate is about logic. It's about thinking and analysis again. It's about presentation of an argument. It's about persuasiveness. Well, yes, some of these points are there in moot courts as well. But there are many, many critical differences. For one, in a debate, you have to pick a side. And therefore, many times you are making an argument for your side. And a lot of those arguments are fact-based and logic-based. But that's not what you do with moot courts, because your greatest tool here is the law. Your argument is persuasive only if the law allows that. Your argument is logical only if it has some foundation in law. And many people who have made good debaters sometimes do not make good mooters because their natural training is for logic, is for factual arguments, is for persuasive presentation of factual points. But a moot court is very different for the persuasiveness and the effectiveness is largely based on legal analysis. And no matter how convincing you are, if your legal analysis is poor, if your research is short, it goes against you far more than it goes in your favor. This is another reason why I think it is not critically important for you to be a very fluent speaker, to have a great grasp over English, to be a good mooter. A good clarity on the law, a good and in-depth understanding of the subject and how you are going to deal with it is more than enough. Now, one query which I often see students ask me is how to choose a moot. There are so many moot courts available. There are moot courts on public international law. There are moot courts on investment law. There are moot courts on trade law. There are trial advocacy moots. There are moot courts on criminal law. There are moot courts on other statutory law like IPR rights. There are just so many varieties of different moot courts. Which moot court should I go for? Now, let me answer this like this. Which moot court should you start with? Often it is advised that you should start with a smaller moot, maybe go to a local moot or go to a smaller national moot before you graduate to some of the more competitive national moots or international moots. My first moot court competition was Commonwealth. And that is a tough uh, competition on an international level. My second moot court competition that I went to was Manfred Lacks, which is also one of the top moot courts. And therefore, my experience is to the contrary. I really don't recommend that you have to first take a step to an easier moot before you step to a bigger moot. Just throw yourself to it. Whatever moot court that you are going for, put your heart and soul in it. And I don't think that uh, there is nothing that stands your way. Now, the first moot court that I went for was Commonwealth, which was on public international law. This was when I had just stepped into my second year and I did not even have a good foundation on constitutional law. Forget having a great foundation of public international law. Now, how did that fare for me? The initial stages were very difficult because I didn't have the foundation in public international law. I had not studied that as a subject. And therefore, the amount of time that it took for me to get accustomed to that particular subject took me a lot more time. But that's exactly what a moot court is about. You pick up a subject which may be entirely unknown. You pick up a factual scenario which you may have never imagined. And then you put your mind to understand something like that. That training is what I'm talking about. Why? You should do moot courts, whether you're going to be a litigating lawyer, you're going to be a corporate lawyer, you're going to be an academician, you're going to uh, write on law, you're going to pick up any other assignment. The excitement and the skill to pick up a new area of law with entirely different facts and the challenge to deal with it, uh, to understand it, and then to get scrutinized on your analysis builds you as a lawyer in so many different ways. A lot of this knowledge doesn't come to you while you are in law school because we are very narrowly focused on the competition. We must do well in the competition and 
Our peers are doing very well. And my friend has won this moot court. That achievement has come his way or her way. Similarly, such achievements should come my way. And sometimes as students, we are so focused on acing the competition and doing well that we lose focus of the knowledge that moot court gives us, which is the confidence to attack a new moot subject, a new problem, a new factual aspect. Now, this is the reason why I feel that everyone should moot. You should not hold yourself back on what kind of moot you are going to do. Just pick up a moot and get on with it. Now, what skills do I need to develop? Some of you might already be preparing for a moot. Some of you might be thinking about picking up a moot in the future. Some of you may even be contemplating. Now, what skills should I work on? It really depends on where you are right now. If in case you are preparing a moot right now, you do not have a lot of time to work on your skills. A lot of your time will directly go on how you're going to prepare for this moot court. But a lot of you who are not doing a moot court now, especially in these COVID times where things are a little more slow in terms of time, it's a great time to prepare for a moot court because it takes some kind of skill preparation. And what I'm intending in this ses eight sessions is to speak about my experiences of the different skills which work. Now, what are the skills which work? The first skill that works is the excitement to do it. If you're not excited to do it, it could seem like a lot of work. It could seem very unrewarding. It could seem very punishing when you're being grilled while the competition is on. So the first skill that you need is really the excitement to do it. If you're not excited, maybe hold off, pick up some other mood. Don't do it for the sake of it. Because if you're not going to enjoy the process, you lose the entire charm of what you learn from a particular mood court. The second skill is reading, and that's not a skill which is specific only to mood courts. That is a skill which is inherent to the profession that we have, whether whatever way we are going to go. It's very important to learn to read. I remember when I was in law school, a professor taught us. He said, look, you must see how many pages can you read in a day before you get bored or before you find yourself sleepy or you find yourself distracted. And mind you, I am still from the times where there was no WhatsApp. So the distractions were far lesser than social media today. And when you start doing this exercise, you remarkably see that your mind might just tire after reading five pages or eight pages, or 12 pages. And people who are able to do 20, 25, 30 pages at a go have actually some kind of training to read. And that sounds very surprising because a lot of us train ourselves to study the evening before the exam. Or, you know, we start doing a work right at the nth hour before the deadline and we think, oh, come on, that particular subject, I picked up the entire book maybe the evening before and I was able to do it and pass my papers. But that's not what moot court requires. Moot court requires a concentrated ability to read a large amount of content. And that is fundamental. If you are going to get tired reading a large amount of material, that is a killer right there. And a lot of students have this complaint when they come for a moot court. They say, Are ye problem I had uh, but you know, I didn't have the time to read all the case laws. Or when I read the case law, I just read the relevant paragraph. Some of them read a commentary and they find a line which is useful. They pick up that line, take the citation from the book, and quote it in a moot court competition without even caring to take the citation out and reading how many judges were on the bench, what were the propositions discussed, what were the propositions which were discussed but not agreed to. And to be able to have the energy to do that. Now, this is like a sports person. I mean, for those of you who watch cricket, back in the 90s, we had celebrated cricketers, but the level of fitness that cricket demands today is not the level of fitness which was there in the 90s which is true for any sport. And with fit cricketers and fit sports persons, they have that extra amount of energy to do things which people did not do earlier. That is an analogy for us as law students and as lawyers. If you don't have that extra energy to read, you are going to find it very difficult to deal with different moot court propositions. 
So it's very important that you see what is your reading speed, what is your reading capacity, and ideally a lawyer should have a reading capacity of at least 100, 150 pages a day. And that takes some kind of habit and working. The second aspect is analysis. And analysis is something which you can learn only over a period of time. It comes only when you think about a proposition, when you debate about a proposition, when you disagree on a proposition, when you feel strongly about a proposition, and many times when you have the courage to realize that what you believed in for five days was entirely wrong. On the fifth day after reading the material and analyzing, you realize, oh, maybe, you know, I was going wrong all through. And maybe there is a whole different way to do it. And this is another critical skill. And this critical skill is very difficult to develop by yourself. While reading, you can read by yourself and you don't re really require any other interaction with another friend or anybody else. That's not the case with analysis. It's very important that what you know, you share, you discuss, you falter. Now, what I'm saying is very critical. It may sound very simple. But we are all very scared of being called out as being wrong. I'm very scared that if somebody asks me a question, I'll give a wrong answer. Or I'm very self-conscious that I'm giving a particular analysis and argument that the person in front might rubbish it and say, oh, come on, I mean, that argument is complete bunkum. And many times we get very scared of putting our analysis forward. And this is a critical skill which you require in a moot court. The confidence to make a mistake, it's very important. When you get a moot court problem, it is like a mirage. In my experience, I have seen the third or the fourth or the sixth reading of a moot court problem, you suddenly discover very new facts. It's a problem sometimes of just four pages, three pages, and you know that you've read it in and out and you understand it fully well. But many times on the sixth and the seventh re reading, you suddenly see a new fact or a new argument comes up. And that's exactly how what you will do with analysis. You may read a particular, you may see a particular proposition, do some reading, do some research and make up your mind. Or maybe this is the answer. The answer is A. But your teammate may think that the answer is B. And you may, you have, you are entitled to vociferously disagree, but you must learn to keep an open mind just in case you are wrong. And this becomes very important in moot courts because any proposition has to be prepared from both sides. You are supposed to argue for both Mr. Narendra Modi as well as Mr. Rahul Gandhi. Unlike a debate where you pick up one proposition and you have the liberty of arguing it one-sided. That's not what you do in a moot court. You are supposed to argue from both sides. And to be able to have the clarity and confidence to do that, you can have it only if you have a skill of analysis. The third skill which is very important to have is the skill to do teamwork. Moot court problems require so much of literature reading, so much of analysis, that it is impossible for one individual in that given time frame to read all the literature, to do all the analysis by himself, and to make the perfect presentation, and to be able to deliver that presentation. It's impossible. I have been interacting with moot courts for over 15, 16 years. I'm telling you, it can never be done. You can never do it alone, which is why it is very important to have good teamwork. And it, these are great lessons. Huh? There are people who have found their life partners while they have mooted. They have found their life enemies while they have mooted. A lot of politics in college life revolves around that. And it is not only a lesson in moot court, it's also a lesson in behavioral sciences. You learn so much about human nature, but it is very important to do teamwork. As a moot judge, I do look out for this kind of fissure in a team, and it's very easy to spot. You'll suddenly see a reticent researcher. There are odd times when I see very cruel researchers also. When the speaker is being grilled, they have a, you know, sneer on their uh, face. They are, oh, great, you know, this guy, I don't get along with it. I'm so happy he or she is being grilled. And it is very easy to spot. Uh, this will be very easy to spot for you also once you become a moot judge after being a mooter. And that kind of team fissure is very easy to spot. 
And as a mooter, when I am a mood judge, I love to exploit that. I know that the two speakers have divergent views. They may not have worked together or the researcher has just been a guest on the team. And this coordination is very critical to a team which does well in the prelim rounds and a team which really wins knockouts. If you really want to win knockouts, if you want to succeed through the quarters, the semis, through the finals, if you are unable to have some kind of workability, even if your teammates are disagreeable teammates or you don't like them, it is very important. And these are skills which cannot be developed overnight. These are also not skills which can be developed over one moot. And a lot of people in moot courts, therefore, find their success after a couple of moots. Even those who are lucky to find success up front, either the success goes to their head and then they falter in the subsequent ones, or there are ones who know that with every moot court they learn with something different. Now, I must have had the experience of reading over 400, 500 moot court problems. And there is something I learn each time that I read a moot court problem or I go to judge a particular moot court competition. Therefore, this process of learning with moot courts, just the system of moot courts, forget the new law that you read, is, is mind blowing. And it's something we must keep our minds open to. Now, how to succeed in moots? And it's very important because I understand at the end of the day, look, if you're going for a moot court, we'll look for that instant reward. It's a, you know, very uh, long life lesson to say, oh, you know, we've learned teamwork in a moot court. We've learned analysis in a moot court. So kya wa hum, uh, round mein knockout ho gaye. So kya wa, you know, we didn't go to quarters. I have very rarely seen students talk about like that. They are more like, mere saath cheating wa. Wo team, wo host team thi, usko zada points de diye. That judge did not know the subject. He did not even uh, concentrate on what was happening. Most times, mooters come up with these reasons which make them upset rather than this large life lesson. So I very clearly understand that when you are going in for a competition, the immediate goal, therefore, is to do well, is to succeed. Now, moot court has a particular format to it. The person who wins a moot court does, is not necessarily the best uh, prepared team or the most well-read team or somebody who has excellent knowledge of the subject. Well, these are very important factors they don't lead to success necessarily. You need to understand that mood court is like a game which also functions on a particular format. There are certain things which you need to do well to win a mood court. And despite you being well read or well researched or the analysis is excellent, your presentation is fantastic, you may not win a knockout round or you may not get the necessary scores to qualify to knockout rounds. Now, how to succeed in a mood court? Obviously, there is no fit formula. And this is the intent of the sessions that I'm going to have. I am going to talk to you about how to deal with different aspects and issues which could uh, give you the necessary skills to succeed in moot courts. And if you do, uh, please give yourself credit. If you don't, please don't blame it on me. Now, what are we going to cover in all of these eight sessions? Now, the first session that I really want to deal with, which will be the next session, is how do you prepare for a moot court? And it may seem very easy or very straightforward for people who have already mooted, but this is the most critical phase. How do you prepare for a moot court? How do you read a problem? That's basic. Often when you ask a particular participant a question, say, you know, uh, it's a question of fact, the mooter is, you know, flummoxed. He'll, he'll look at the moot problem, he'll then say, uh, if your lordships could refer to such and such point. So the mood court, mooter looks very tentative. What kind of a mooter looks effective? If you ask you a question, if you are, if you ask them a question on facts, where in the mood court problem is it given that there was collusion between the prime minister of the country and the home minister? You say that the answer to that is your lordships at page three. Paragraph 7, line 2 of the moot court problem, the word which has been given is a detailed interaction between the Prime Minister and the Home Minister. And therefore, the word detailed interaction, prima facie shows that there was some kind of collusion. That is a great way of answering. How do you prepare that? That preparation starts at the beginning. How do you read a moot court problem? 
how do you analyze a mood code problem and how do you mark a mood code problem you usually have any time between 15 20 days to 4 months to prepare a mood code problem to prepare a mood competition over this period you would read this mood problem multiple times you must have a system to read a mood problem such that by the time you go for the competition you have more or less remembered the problem by rote and i realized that to many competitions that i went to where i achieved some amount of success it largely came from small aspects like that there is so much certainty in being able to pinpoint where the fact lies on a mood sheet how do you do that we will talk about it in the next session another aspect is how to identify read and apply the law this can be very challenging especially for first time mooters this can be very challenging if you are early in law school and you've not really had the overview of different subjects and you suddenly read a particular fact sheet you are unable to identify which laws apply to it and look we are a country of many laws so sometimes it can be very different difficult to exhaustively know which all statutes are applicable and that is very important there must be a system whereby you must be able to train yourself to know this and knowledge is not just to know the statute knowledge is largely to be able to know where to find the statute how to find what's the applicable law whether this is approaching your faculty or your seniors or to approach lawyers wherever you are going to seek help there is a particular system to be able to know how to see which are the laws which are to be identified to be studied it's only thereafter that you can really see which provisions apply and what you must read and what case laws apply there must be a particular system of dealing with that a very regular question that comes my way is to what extent am i supposed to research in a moot court say i'm going for a moot court on criminal law it's a moot court revolving around uh, murder uh, maybe it's about section 300 of the ipc the fourth point on murder where knowledge can also be attributed to intent how what all am i supposed to read in such a situation i can't possibly read all of the ipc can i possibly read all of the crpc can i possibly read all decisions which have happened on murder what decisions am i supposed to read am i only supposed to read decisions by the supreme court am i supposed to read decisions of all high courts am i supposed to read decisions of different uh, lower courts to what extent am i going to study and law is vast it's endless the maxim nemo judex in re sua which says ignorance of law is no excuse is an anathema it means that you must know all of the law and this is for citizens every citizen must know all of the law that's the presumption and as a lawyer your burden is higher you are training to know all of the law is it possible to know all of the law and its nuances certainly not it's inhuman it's impossible for a human to do that and therefore you cannot go into a moot court having read every word every line every page every case law how do i then deal with the moot court where there can be so many different subjects to read so many different aspects to read and i think that requires a particular amount of training and understanding and system to be able for you to be able to do it in a given time frame i learned it at one of the competitions that i went for and because i extensively debated in school i believed in a lot of extent pre arguments that you must think about the law you must analyze the law but not rehearse it so much that when you finally argue it doesn't sound fresh to your own self if it becomes stale if you've debated it so much when you when you're finally presented it to before a judge maybe that zing goes away that excitement to present it goes away and my view was while you should analyze while you should think while you should prepare you shouldn't rehearse so much that you sound jaded or it sounds stale there must be some zing and excitement to your argument when you're finally presenting it and i remember arguing semi finals in manfred we were up against a team where this uh, muter had had meticulously made 
all possible questions that could be asked on that given moot court problem. And she had written answers to that. And what was remarkable is that she had learned it up by rote. It was like a parrot. She was asked a question and she was like, and the answer to that is blah, 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 no emotion, nothing. And I remember sitting in my chair and flipping and thinking, I have no answer to something like that. I'm thoroughly unprepared. This person is so mechanically well prepared that not only does she know the answers to every question, she has pre-drafted those answers. Therefore, what she's saying doesn't have a loose comma or a loose full stop anywhere. And in the given situation, I was panicking because I realized one has to do something more than what one had prepared. You can't just go with the flow and, you know, speak in such flamboyance that you're going to trump that. That was hardcore, cold analysis of whatever legal points she was presenting. And I learned a lot from that. I realized that, you know, that kind of preparation is of another level. Now, that is also something which you must keep in mind. What I learned, and this is what I keep telling everybody, if you are able to make a list of questions which are very probable in a moot court problem, I see there are at least 20, 30 questions which are most probable questions, which in every prelims is asked from most of the teams. And if you're able to this, do this kind of preparation, where you're not only knowing the answer, but you've probably written it down on a piece of paper or typed it out on a computer. And while you know, you're traveling to the mood, you're on a flight, you're on a train, you're just flipping and reading those answers, just habitually putting it in your memory. I'm not suggesting that you learn it by rote. It's probably uh, impossible to learn every question and answer by rote. But if you've been able to write it down, there is a structure of presentation to that answer. And therefore, some of these tips and tricks uh, really make a wholesome difference in the kind of presentation you make. And that's not just in mood quotes. That is a very good skill to have later in life, whatever field you take after being a, after graduating from law school. Now, what can be very embarrassing in a moot court is for you to appear for the petitioner and start arguing in favor of the respondent. And that happens many a time because you have spent so much of your time preparing for both sides. Sometimes in the heat of the moment, out of nervousness, uh, out of, you know, strong grilling and questioning, you just, you know, make that critical mistake of arguing for the respondent on that proposition instead of the petitioner. And this is a very common mistake which the human mind makes. But it's it doesn't look good at all. It's terrible for optics. I remember somebody who did that mistake and then it was pointed out very cheekily said, oh, and those are really the arguments you should not make. That's what I was saying. You see, that kind of cleverness doesn't cut eyes with anybody. It was very clear that he made a mistake and he's just now you know, trying to be a smart aleck, trying to get out of that situation. So it's very important to have some kind of rituals that you don't make errors like these. And these errors are very easy to make. Team roles. I've already spoken about team communication. I'll probably share a personal story here. Uh, this was Commonwealth. And uh, this is right before the moot court. And everybody has a particular ritual before you're going for an exam or you're going for any moot court or any session like that. My ritual was that in the days when there was Walkman, I don't know how many of you still remember days of Walkman, for the last 10 minutes before the rounds would begin, I had a favorite piece of music which I wanted to listen to just to pump myself up, just to cut out any other thought, just to focus myself on what I was going to do. And I remember my friend, my co-mooter, he asked me a question. And he said, look, what's the difference between liability and responsibility in that particular treaty? And I said, oh, great, you know, not right now. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. And I kept pushing that off. And he was the first speaker. And the first question that was asked of him was, what's the difference between liability and responsibility? And I remember he gave me a dirty look while he was presenting. And he said, you know, in this particular uh, treaty, it's one and the same. When I came to present, the judge had noticed that my friend, my co-speaker, had given me a dirty look. So he noticed that there was something to this and he asked me the same question. He said, hey, hold on, before you say anything else, can you tell us what's the difference between liability and responsibility in this treaty? 
and indeed there was a difference. I was faced with a situation where either I was going to say the wrong answer but be a good teammate or I was going to stab my friend right in the heart and say oh he gave you the wrong answer I am telling you that this is the correct answer. So I did the latter I stabbed my friend right in the heart and I told the court look this is the difference between liability and responsibility and the judge grilled me on it he said look I mean of course you're making a uh, contradictory submission because your first speaker said something else you're changing this time and of course that was uncomfortable ground I tried to cover to say what's more important is to give the right proposition of law and as long as we as a team are being able to do it I don't think my friend's answer should prejudice her arguments but terrible optics I I can tell you that my friend almost 15 years yeah almost 15 years to the date Whenever we are to talk about this subject, he still brings it on. And he still says, look, I will never forgive you because for that five minutes of your Walkman, the embarrassment that you made me go through was tremendous. And look, what a hero you tried to make of yourself. Oh, he doesn't know the answer. I know the answer. So team role and team conversation is very important. And therefore, you know, we will be dealing with that extensively. The embarrassment that we went through shouldn't be an embarrassment that you will have to go through. The session three and session four is for memorials. And this is very important. In fact, this is such an important such subject that an entire series can be done just on memorials. Uh, we will just be able to cover scratch through some important points. And it's very important to know how do you do that. It's one thing to be able to read a problem, read the law, understand what the answers are and how do you strategize and structure your arguments. It's quite another to put it on a piece of paper. And it also deals with drafting skills. Drafting skills like analysis is again something which you learn only over a period of time after you've gone through substantial experience of doing it. It largely depends on your skills as a writer. So more, not so much as a lawyer. But as a writer, you may write very fluently. But again, what you're supposed to write must make legal persuasive sense. For example, if you have to answer a particular proposition, often in memorials, students labor on the factual points first. This is the facts, this is what it is, and therefore you see this has been said, that has been said, this has been said. Please see there is a similar case law which has dealt with such a such fact, and in the footnote they will give 16 case laws, or 10 case laws, or 8 case laws without explaining as to how each of those eight and 10 case laws are relevant for the subject. And that's, that's just suicide. That's just suicide. You will be asked, oh, please, this particular case law, tell us the facts. That particular case law, tell us which court is it. And you are yourself putting yourself in a trap, which is terrible. And therefore, it's very important that when you are case citing something, you need to know what to cite, how to cite. What not to cite is also very important. You see, bulking up a memo is, is one of the critical mistakes which most mooters make. They think that if my moot court memorial has 200 cited cases, what a wonderful job I have done. Without realizing that when you go for oral presentations, you could be asked questions on each of those 200 case laws. Sometimes you will face situations where the judges have, uh, moot judges, have been lawyers on those case laws themselves. And therefore, they know that case law at the back of their mind, the kind of grilling you go through. Is, is, is unforgivable. That kind of grieving is punishing. So it's very important that we know how to present those legal points. Is it, is it then good to first present the facts and then the law or sometimes is it good to just grab it by the collar, cite the law and then say, look, this is how it goes straight on my points. So we'll deal with that, whether it's an inductive approach or a deductive approach to building that argument, uh, we'll see that. Case citations. Often a lot of mooters cite and reproduce a lot of extracts from judgments, again to bulk up the memo. You always have a very set time limit and a very set paper limit to do a memo. And if you are going to do a lot of case citations, it takes you far longer to format those memos. If you are going to do a lot of citations, it is going to exceed the page limit for the moot court. A memorial must be a synopsis, a brief, a formulae, a, an algorithm of 
how do you intend to persuade another human being on that point, especially another human being who has a legally trained mind? It really doesn't matter. The optics of too many case notes, the optics of too many citations, the optics of putting too many things in quotes, bold, italics, underline, all of these are an ISO. These are not what you're supposed to do in a memorial. These are not ways in which you make an argument more presentable and effective. So we will deal with some of those aspects when we are dealing with memorials. It is almost impossible, and I say that with a lot of guarantee, it is almost impossible to make an error-free memorial. I wish that's the case. It's something to aspire to, but it's almost impossible to make an error-free memorial. And therefore, it's very important that something like this, which is so inherently susceptible to errors, you must have systems to eliminate errors, have as little errors as possible. And that takes a lot of effort. A very simple thing is that if the deadline is to submit the memorial on the 25th, I'll finish my memorial on 20th, I'll revise it for five days, I'll send it out for other people to revise it, and I'll submit it on 25th. 99% of the times you will be struggling on the evening of 25th to format your memo. And that is something which is, you know, very common. Which is why it's very important that your processes must be in order, that you're not struggling to look for and review those errors at the nth hour. Very important. We'll deal with that extensively. Then one mistake which I see many mutas make with memorials is that they sort of see that as the Bible document for their moot court. And while they are preparing for their orals, they are reading their memorials. Uh, a memorial is a very different way of argument. And more so in a country like ours. We are a very verbose, conversational country. Even in our courts, we are arguing for a long time. There are no set limits. Uh, we like to talk. It's Amartya Sen in the book, Argumentative Indian has defined us very well. We are a nation which loves to talk. And if you are going to switch on any news channel, especially around this time, I mean, I really don't re have to convince you on that point. And therefore, how we talk an argument is very different from how we write an argument. And if that is the case, should we be reading a memorial to pre prepare our oral arguments? Absolutely not. I mean, that, that is like putting a trap on your leg. It's like tying a heavy lead ball to your leg and then trying to run. How you prepare for your oral arguments is very different from how you present something on a memorial. And while it's very important that you must know how to refer your memorial, that's not the base document from which oral presentations are prepared. Another thing where there is very little effort is how to read the opponent's memorial. It's very important. And I, I found it very exciting during my mooting days to be served a copy of the opponent's memorial half an hour before the round or an hour before the round and being able to read it so thoroughly that you are able to see through their strategy. And while you are going to present your arguments, you're already able to foresee what they're going to argue, what's their line of argument. And how do you cut them out? If say you are the petitioner or the applicant, you already know what the respondent is going to say that in defense. Excellent, cut them out right at the beginning. So when they will say it, the judges would already know that this argument is, is not good. If say I am appearing for the respondent, I know exactly what the petitioner is going to say and therefore I can pre-prepare what defenses I am going to make. It's not going to be as a respondent me speaking about my set narrative. It then so much becomes about what the petitioner has presented with his case. Even in case I thought that to make a particular argument I have four sub-arguments, I will not necessarily go in the sequence of those sub-arguments. I will attack the mistake that the petitioner has made up front. Because this is not about a speech where you give it in a sequence. This is not that your memorial structure must be the same as your oral structure. When you're making an oral argument, you are essentially convincing three human beings or two human beings or one human being that your argument is better than the other team's argument. And therefore, that kind of situational awareness is very important. And if you are able to read your memorial well and read the opposite's memo side's memorial well, 
it gives you a, a start. You get some kind of advantage even before the round commences. So we will deal with that also. Session five is about preparing for oral arguments. And these are very basic things, but it's very important to say that even to mooters who have experience of doing it, because in India especially, there's a lot of back and forth between judges and mooters. It's a lot of question and answers. And many times your oral presentation is really not in the sequence in which you have prepared it. It's largely about the judges questioning you, and most times without any trust or belief. They are going to look at you and say, oh, what bonkers, what are you saying? It's a completely wrong argument. Forget it, you say that. You know that, you know what this. They will do everything to break your confidence. And so many questions and answers, it becomes impossible to deal with time limits. You have 10 different points to say, but you've been stuck on the first point for the entire duration of your speech. You've been unable to you know, answer anything else. And suddenly you say two minutes are over and the judges say, oh, please summarize. And you think that's that's patently unfair. You did not give me the chance of presenting whatever I wanted to say. And now with one point said and eight points not said, you can't expect me to summarize in two minutes. I mean, I prepared it for four months. I have so much more to say. So it's very important that basic aspects of how to introduce yourself to a judge, how to deal with issues, how to deal with the uh, narration of facts, how to deal with case citations, how to hand over compilations to the court. Those things require a very strong routine. You must be so strong with those routines that you should be able to do it without thought and mechanically. So we will deal with that because I think that makes a lot of difference between teams which are good in prelims and teams which make it to quarters. A lot of this happens here because teams who are very good with some of these fundamentals are able to get a lot more time to say a lot more points. Session seven, six and seven. That's a session very close to my heart. In fact, I've had the chance of writing a chapter on a moot court book. And that is what do you do on the day of presentation? Once you've taken the podium, all your preparation is done. All your discussions is done. Everything is ready. Now you're in the spotlight. If you made a wrong answer, only your memory, and that also the thing which you remember in the given time. A lot of times you know an answer, but in the heat of the moment, the answer doesn't come to you. Sometimes you face a very aggressive judge. He's just not letting you talk. Sometimes you deal with a passive judge who's, who's sleeping on the bench. It's not even you know noticing what you're saying. You're making a great point, a great nuance argument, and he doesn't even know it's a great nuance argument. He's like, okay, okay, take it, chalo, you know. I'm just waiting for these 18 minutes to get over. I'm just munching on these, you know, uh, biscuits that I've been given to munch. A lot of times judges are thinking, okay, once this gets over, I have to get back to my office and do this work, that work. It's very important for you to know while you're on the podium, how to deal with situations like that. How do you deal with situations where you've made a patent error? You've said an argument and you've been found out that it's wrong. You say that such and such case law says that and the judge says, oh, no, you see, I'm giving you this case law. This, this particular judgment doesn't say that. How do you deal when you're on sticky wicket on things like that? And I think some of these aspects are, are very important, very interesting, because there are no set rules to it. And I really am looking forward to session six and seven, while that's going to be towards the end of the series. But that's a lot of fun because I'll be sharing with a lot of experiences uh, some very funny experiences that I've had while I was a mooter, while I've seen as a moot court judge, while I'm seeing now as a lawyer in court. Session eight is tips and tricks. And these are tips and tricks which I have largely learned while I started judging moot courts. When I started judging moot courts, I sort of got an eagle's overview of a lot of things which were very difficult for me to know as a mooter because I was so heavily concentrated on winning the competition, on remembering my facts, on making my arguments well, or keeping my compilations in order, of dealing with my team. So many, sorry, so many different aspects that I have to deal with. How do I deal with those things efficiently? And I think that, you know, a separate session on those tips and tricks are very important. That is a session where I expect a lot of interaction. And therefore, maybe what I'll request is by the end of section, session seven, I'd be very happy to get questions. Uh, perhaps you know they could be collated and sent to me over email, 
and I could deal with individual points, which you must have faced while you've done a moot court, where you said, look, such and such experience happened, and what could have I done better? Or did I do well? Is there any other way of doing it? And that last session would be for something like that. With this, I think that's how I want to begin with this series. I want to make it conversational. It's a 7 p.m. session. It's not, I don't want to be the lullaby singer for you. I don't want to lull you to sleep in the evening. The idea is it's supposed to be engaging. It's supposed to be fun. Uh, it's not supposed to be lecture oriented. I understand the limitations of doing this over video conferencing and therefore there cannot be so much of interaction and you will have to bear with my voice in your earpieces. But uh, if there is some way of engaging either in terms of uh, sending me some kind of feedback at the end of sessions or questions that I could deal with on the next session, I'll be very happy. Uh, the end of every session, it's one and a half hours and that's, that's a long time for a human mind to concentrate. Maybe the last 15, 20 minutes of every session, we can keep for that kind of question and answers instead of me rambling on in a monotonous monologue of what I think. So with this, uh, thank you so much for joining in uh, today evening. I am very excitedly looking forward to these sessions. And uh, I hope we are going to have a lot of fun this month doing this. Thank you. Thank and you, sir. It's such a wonderful and interesting session and I really wanted to, you know, know so much experience you have shared and I think that when you share the experience in the last sessions, uh, it will be more useful for the students. Now, I would uh, like to ask the students if you want to ask any questions, you can write in the chat box. Yes, anybody who wants to ask any question, you can write in the chat box. In the meantime, Animesh, uh, when students will write their questions, I want to ask a question that how much is sure. the relevance of the non-verbal communication and gesture, body language uh, in mood code competition? Because we also take this topic here uh, in our course uh, we, we, when we teach. So uh, what is the relevance of that? Very important, ma'am. Very important. And while it's nobody's business to tell anybody how to dress, it's first and foremost, you must a motor must be formally dressed. It's very important. Uh, it doesn't look good if you have a disheveled beard or if you have clothing which is not formal. So that's very important. Secondly, like I said, it's very, you know, judges catch how you're interacting with your team while you're sitting together. Say, you know, the opposite side is arguing a lot of times you'll say people are doing like this. Oh, no, 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 this is not weird. Judges find that very irritating. So yeah. it's very important that when you are dealing with it, you must look professional, you must look serious, and it must look that the strength of what you're going to do is in the way you're going to speak. A lot yeah. of hand gestures is not, uh, you know, it's great for public speaking, but you shouldn't do that when you're doing mood courts. Uh, mm. There is, mood courts is a somber and serious activity. And therefore, you know, I deal with a few examples whether you should use words like you, sorry, please, some of these basic things are also very important. How much you should bow down on a bench. Yeah. There are times when you have somebody who is literally, you know, banging his head and bowing down so much. Whether you should do things like that. So non-verbal yeah. communications are very important. Yeah. Okay. So I think the uh, lecture is so comprehensive. You have taken the session so nicely that everything is clear, I think, to them. So that is why uh, they are not asking any question and they are praising your efforts by writing good students. words in the chat box. It is also students' hesitation, ma'am. I've been a student myself and sometimes we are very concerned. What question am I asking? Are people going to judge yeah. me for the question that I've asked? And I think that's that's one glass barrier which you have to break if you're going to be a mooter. I said this up front. Yeah. If you are scared of you know, being out there, my question is not going to be a good thing. No one to me. What point is this? If you're going to be caught in things like that, that's that's one of the first barriers you need to break to be a good mooter. Okay, so I think uh, after your this conversation, somebody has uh, got the courage to ask a question. As Neha is asking, if a mood problem is uh, based on a real-life event, especially on a criminal event, 
uh, it limits our scope for personal uh, interpretation. How should we approach in such a case, sir? I think it's very important that we need to stick to the law. One moot court uh, that I went to was very similar to the case where uh, one celebrity had uh, run over some pedestrians. And we had a case like that. And I remember one of the teams had brought a fog report of that day, saying that, look, it was very foggy, and therefore that's a defense. That's that's completely bunkum because that was not part of the moot court problem at all. And that kind of adventurism doesn't help you. Look, at the end of the day, the moot court problem is is a game to look at how well you understand a problem and how well you apply the law to it. And therefore, personal interpretations are not so important. It's more important how you are able to apply the law. That should be primary. That makes you look like a serious professional leader also. Right. right. I see there's one more question from Vandana. Yeah. Vandana Tyagi is asking, can we present our points in oral arguments which are not mentioned in the memorial? You see, there are many moot courts which have this rule that you should not say, you know, you should be limited to your memorial. But you hmm. see, practically, that's not how it goes. And therefore, you know, if you have a point which is separate from your memorial, uh, I would I would encourage you to go ahead. I've never really seen somebody open a memorial and say, oh, that's your argument on the memorial is very different from what you're doing orally. Practically, that doesn't happen. Even if it, that happens, you explain why you are taking that view and as a lawyer if you are able to think through a sound argument nobody is going to dock you point simply because you did not put it on your memorial right so another question is of azhar whether you will take research as a topic in your sessions briefly, How to briefly. i wouldn't really go yes in depth into it because i'm sure you are going to have research papers in uh, uh, in your curriculum yes. And you would learn how to do research on propositions. But I will, what I would want to deal with is how do you research on issues like how do you deal with the literature of the problem? How do you deal with procedural aspects? How do you deal with points which are not directly connected to your problem? I will be dealing with those kind of points. Right, right. That will be important. And how, next question is how important is it to know how to research through uh, sources like but again they are asking the same question don't worry students i will share i will share the uh, uh, a webinar with you which is exclusively on research it will be very useful for you i will share the link shortly so ask any question uh, other than research so i think it is very interesting session animesh and i hope that uh, more to come in uh, next sessions and uh, i think the students will get uh, wonderful you know exposure to all these uh, techniques because you have done yourself mooting and now you are judging so you have both kind of exposure so that's why so now they are uh, only praising your session so i think that uh, uh, they are uh, they are not interested in asking more questions so if you want to say anything, you can say. Otherwise, praise is a praise is a, a brahmastra for mooters. Brahmastra so get swayed away. Okay, you know, okay. You well, in your first moods, you are bound to mess it up the next time. So it's it's good if you fail. So while I'm very happy, thank you so much for kind words, but. Uh, Let's hold on and let's have better sessions. Yeah. So uh, how to read full judgment properly? Uh, another question is, uh, how to read full judgment properly, sir, without getting uh, detached or getting uh, bored judgment of uh, like 120 pages? I because in today's class, that. I have discussed that they have to read the full judgment when they cite. <laughs> So that's that's why I, I must I must tell you honestly I still get bored reading many judgments, and uh, that's very human to be interested in some subjects and not be interested in another. But when you are going to be on a mood court or, or when you are going to be on a hunt on a particular proposition, you know the even a dead judgment comes alive. If you're not hunting for something in a problem mood judgment, you're just reading it for the sake of it. I understand it can get boring sometimes. Another question is, he has already discussed in his lecture that mooting skill is very helpful in the career as an 
good advocate that you have already deliberated upon uh, yes any other any question comment? you want to ask what else is important in a cv other than mooting so he is uh, he is talking that is mooting. that is more for people who are looking for internships and then later uh, getting <laughs> jobs you must look diligent on your cv that's it uh what stands out in most cv you know people don't really see how much you scored in school or what cgpa you are scoring if you look diligent if you look busy in law school uh, that's that's most important it doesn't matter what quality of internships you've done what quality of moot courts you have done what's most important is you must look diligent and busy in law school okay that's good that's good so even if they do internship or uh, some projects etc it will be also useful Okay. Anything. So anything question, yeah. Another question is, sir, what uh, are some good resources for legal uh, literature on uh, international criminal law? So you know that is again a research-based question. I mean, one is we live in world where there is Google and a lot of uh, international court decisions are available in the public domain so you don't really have to have access to some of these paid portals to get access to them you could simply go on to the website of uh, icc and you could get a lot of literature there okay so yes uh, students uh, who want to sit in judiciary exam how moot can help them for judicial services tremendously tremendously uh, some of my friends who become judges or people i know who have become judges uh you see in a given roster on a given day you may have to deal with anything between 30 to 150 cases some of these cases might be very different from the other and as a lawyer you have the liberty to falter but as a judge you have to be far more cautious that you know you are being able to know it fully well and understand it well and moot courts allows you to learn how to pick up a new subject how to deal with it it allows you to appreciate court mannerisms and how to deal with wrong court mannerisms and uh, largely helps you analyze the law, which you'll have to do as a judge on case to case basis in very short time. So it will be of great help. Yeah, true. That's true. Uh, another question is, can we cite live law in citation? No. Live law is nowadays very popular. So that is why they are asking. No, you cannot cite. No. You see, I can I can tell you some very interesting stories. I had one story where we were briefing uh, Mr. Fali Nariman, and he said that he just relies on SCR, Supreme Court reports. He doesn't even want to rely on SCCs, which is fairly oh. acceptable in the Supreme Court. And uh, therefore, you know, there is a lot of emphasis on true reporting. Sometimes even the best editor editorials there are some discrepancies from the original text of judgments. So live law, no. OK, so I think a lot of questions we have already asked. Now I request Dr. Sushmita to present a vote of thanks to our esteemed guest. Hello, Animesh. It's very good to listen to you after a long time. Nice to see you. It has been uh, 12 years, I, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> That's right, ma'am. Yeah. And uh, you know, you know te te teachers, yeah. teachers not only know the time, they know exactly how good you were 12 years back. Yes, as listening and uh, you know, uh, with the teamwork, you know, what I really like is that uh, one point which you have uh, made that there is a need for teamwork, which I feel nowadays uh, that team spirit is uh, not there many a times, uh, which I have noticed. Uh, with the students, uh, you know, that kind of uh, things. And uh, one another, you have also differentiated between the, you know, mood for debating. And uh, if I'm not wrong, there is also a difference between, you know, their uh, mood court. Uh, I may be an expert as a mooter, but that does not mean that in the real court, if I go, I will be, you know, succeeding there. So that kind of difference uh, here we are uh, doing, working in a professional manner. Uh, with the intention of winning the moods. But if you go to the real courts, that kind of difference. So same can happen. Some uh, some feel that I am a good uh, you know, lawyer. I can uh, I go and argue in the courts. But uh, in the moot court competition, sometimes you know that uh, that performance may not be evaluated with the parameters. 
so it's really uh, inspiring to uh, for the students i was noticing that you know earlier they were hesitant to ask the questions later on uh, you know the the flow of the questions uh, showed that the coming sessions which you have planned very well planned and it will help them a lot and with regard to the uh, you know working of our mukur society anvesh i would like to tell that ours is an open society you know all the students will get a chance it's not like that uh, in our uh, amiti we have the closed society you know only the mood court students used to participate and that really makes a uh, you know huge difference i have not come across any other institution where every student uh, will get a chance uh, only the mood court society members used to get but here our society is like that uh, you know it's an open society where everybody every suppose if i reach in the final year and now i feel like participating in the mood so i can definitely uh, participate in the mood so like that uh, there is a difference uh, in the working of uh, the mood court society in uh, law center 1 so i take this of course i take this uh, officially you know privilege to express my sincere thanks for uh, taking your valuable time in this uh, you know pandemic time and uh, it's like it almost one and a half hours you have uh, spent for us and looking forward for more sessions with you which will be beneficial for our students i extend uh, on behalf of law center 1 and also you know for on behalf of the students my sincere thanks uh, for being with us today and accepting the invitation by sanjeevini ma'am and uh, secondly i would like to express my thanks to our students you know uh, in the in the people if you see it was shown as 100 but you know there were hidden students that's very surprising if you take the attendance we can see more than 150 students so you know see the technology is like that if you see here you can see now see the 55 but if you go with the real attendance it is more than that so it's, it's really good that students are listening to you whatever you speak whatever you do so i i also take this opportunity to our students who are very keen and uh, to learn about the mooting skills to participate in the moot and how to improve uh, you know their advocacy skills in this way so i take this for our students and also our uh, pic ma'am sarabjit ma'am for giving us uh, the opportunity to organize uh, this type of workshops and it is you are uh, you know you are pushing us you are pressurizing us karo 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 kuch karo kar rahe ho you know that pressure really under the leadership of uh, alok sharma ma'am materialized today And, uh, so i express uh, thanks to you ma'am and also sanjeevini ma'am who is the you not know, much better because sanjeevini ma'am is the instrumental in uh, making this a you know success so i take this opportunity to thank uh, sanjeevini ma'am as well and my other uh, colleagues in the committee dr daya pushkar then uh, shivika and all other so if i miss anyone uh, from thanking i'm sorry but i take Every each and every one of you from my heart also I express thanks to you. Have a good day. Take care. Okay, so uh, so uh, uh, now I think uh, thank you all for joining us in the first session on Moot Court uh, workshop. I hope that on Monday. Uh, we have the second session of the workshop so kindly join in time to have more you know exposure towards the skills towards techniques of mooting which will definitely help you in your future in the uh, preparation for your moot for exams for competitions so i hope that animesh will uh, deliver his sessions uh, in this interesting way so thank you animesh thank you madam for giving us the opportunity to organize this workshop thank you all thank, thank you. you thank you ma'am it's been a pleasure i i met two of my teachers it has made my day thank you thank you thank you okay bye bye thank you so much everyone